everyone and welcome to our latest uh, Policy Scotland event. Uh, in many respects, as you say, Des, our guest tonight requires very little in, by way of introduction, especially to those of you with a keen interest in the Scottish Parliament and uh, First Minister's questions. Uh, as presiding officer at Holyrood since uh, 2016, the Right Honourable Ken McIntosh, MSP, is familiar as the man in the middle, the politically impartial enforcer charged with uh, chairing chamber debates and keeping order during what are often fiery exchanges of First Minister's questions. Uh, but as I'm sure you will hear tonight, uh, the writ of the presiding officer extends far beyond the debating chamber because uh, Ken is responsible for representing the parliament both here in Scotland and indeed beyond Scotland. He also chairs Holyrood's Business Bureau and Corporate Body, which uh, has perhaps made more headlines recently than at any point since the Parliament was uh, reconvened in 1999. Now, Ken was a member of that original class of MSPs elected to represent the Eastwood constituency. He held that seat at the three subsequent elections and he served as a ministerial aide to Jack McConnell when he was in Butte House. Ken was then appointed to a variety of shadow ministerial briefs, uh, including schools and skills, uh, culture and external affairs, education, finance, social justice, and community. And Ken also twice stood for the leadership of the Scottish Labour Party. All this means that he's ex expertly placed to reflect on two decades of devolution and how the Scottish Parliament and politics have changed and developed over this period. And while there's no doubt that Holyrood has cemented itself as a central component of Scottish political, uh, social and economic life, how and whether uh, its procedures could be further refined, I think remains a real source of much debate. Um, few have, have had a better vantage point to observe the workings of uh, Parliament than Ken himself, and I, I really look forward to his uh, valedictory reflections on Parliament as it is and how it should be. And more broadly, as one of Scotland's most experienced and respected politicians, Ken is uh, well placed to survey the political landscape as we approach the Scottish elections in six weeks' time. And like Ken, other members of that original class of 1999, uh, such as uh, Rosanna Cunningham, uh, Lane Smith, Bruce Crawford, Joanne Lamont, Lewis MacDonald and Alex Neal are all standing down in May. Uh, other MSPs from Ruth uh, Davidson to Jean Freeman and Jenny Mara to Adam Tonkins are also exiting the, the Hollywood fray. So there's a huge amount of change uh, and this election represents a bit of the changing of the guard. So I'm sure you'll be interested in Ken's take on the challenges ahead as a new generation of politicians prepares to take uh, up the baton. Uh, so this promises to be a thought-provoking and lively session, and at an extremely busy time with Parliament, we're really grateful that Ken has found time in his diary to be with us tonight. This is uh, one of those weeks in Parliament. Uh, despite a rough and double, though, of Scottish uh, politics, Ken is recognised across the political spectrum as an accomplished, articulate and really thoughtful parliamentarian. Albeit virtually, we're really delighted to welcome him to the University this evening. I'd like to thank colleagues of Policy Scotland for organising this event, and to Des McNaughty, another of that 1999 intake of MSPs, Des, uh, thank you for acting as chair and over to you, Des. Thanks very much, Anton. So, Ken, there is obviously a huge amount to, to being presiding officer. Can you maybe start by telling us, you know, what parts you enjoy most and what, what you think um, the presiding officer can do in, 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 in that role? Thanks very much, Des, uh, uh, and to you, Anton, for these uh, kind introductory remarks. Can I just also congratulate you on your uh, impeccable timing. Um, my key to my position is being impartial. Um, and given that we've got a vote of no confidence in the First Minister tomorrow morning, I think you'll be testing my impartiality to the limits tonight with some of the questions you'll be putting to me. Um, but yeah, perhaps I could just start, uh, Des, on, on, on being presenting officer on the role. Um, the... the uh, it's quite easy to tell you which parts I dislike most of all, if, you, if I may put it that way, and that is not being able to speak my mind. I mean, nobody, I don't think anybody comes into Parliament or goes into Parliament to become presiding officer. You go in to change things, to speak up for people, to make a difference. And the role of presiding officer is totally different. You're there to protect the Parliament, to stand up for the Parliament. But that is the bit that I like most of all about the role. I, um, when I was a young politician, you know, when I was a, a, a young man, I was a student at university, I joined the Labour Party and it was a long time after that that I put my name forward and it was because of devolution, it was because of the, the promise that the Scottish Parliament gave, this idea of a new form of politics. Sorry, Ken, you've, you've gone mute. Oh, I wonder how that happened. Right. Yeah. 
Okay, we're so we're so used to technology now. I'm, my hands are nowhere near the buttons. I can assure you. So, um, yeah. So it, it was the Scottish Parliament that prompted me to go from you know being a, a well a, a member of a party to to standing as a candidate myself. So there was always that belief in the Parliament and in the the principles in which it was founded. And as presiding officer, uh, that's what attracted me to put myself forward as presiding officer, that you can stand up, be a champion for the parliament and make sure that it's still true to those principles of access, of you know, a more collegiate way of working, of um, sharing power with the people of Scotland. I think these are really promoting equality. These are really important principles to which I'm sure we'll return. But just on my role, on, on the role of the PO, it's the first vote, just to let you know the practicalities, but it's the first vote that MSPs take when they're elected. So election coming up on the 6th of May, the very first thing that MSPs will do after sworn in, sworn in is elect a new presiding officer, and it's the only secret ballot. So now in theory, that means that, well, no one knows how you vote, and in theory, that means it's, it's, uh, well, it's slightly less open to influence from the party whips. I'm not gonna pretend the party whips won't try to exert influence as they always do. Um, but it definitely creates a bond of trust. You're, you're elected by your peers, and it's the first thing you do is you leave your political party if you're successful. So there's a trust, a bond of trust there between your MSPs and you. They, they are asking you to uh, preside over the chamber in an impartial way, and that's very important. Uh, the, the most high profile part of that, everyone will know, is First Minister's questions every week. But First Minister's Questions is actually really quite a unique part of the week, and it's not really like any of the other um, parliamentary exchanges, uh, either like committees or even like any of the other debates. It is particularly robust, particularly combative. Um, so in terms of my role, even the way you, you preside over it, most MSPs, most of the time, are they're not just pleasant to each other, they're actually quite amicable. You know, they get on very well, they're always trying to reach agreement. Most of politics is about trying to reach agreements, but persuasion and trying to work out where you agree and you can get things done. First Minister's Questions is far more adversarial. Um, it's more of a, a political theatre as much as anything else. And so um, that's a bit of a challenge within the chair because um, people's expectations of the way you behave and the way the members behave are different at FMQs than the rest of the week. Oh, absolutely not. And uh, I, think, I think, Des, you're being heckled though. <laughs> So, um, but, but FMQs is, is important. It's an important chance for the public to see and to be engaged in the political process. Um, but I have many other roles. So the most, um, probably the most important ones in a practical sense are chairing two of the bodies that, uh, that run the parliament. One is the, the bureau, the political bureau, which decides the business and the other is the corporate body, the SPCB. So just on the bureau, first of all, I should also point out that the parliament is founded on the principle of transparency. You should always be able to follow what's going on, see the meetings, observe them, listen in. Um, the bureau and the corporate body are the only two which are they're transparent in the sense that their minutes are published, their agendas published, and so on. But but they're not televised live. And um, so the bureau, uh, this is the body on which every political party with five members or more has a representative. It just so happens in this political in this parliament that all the parties have five members or more, the Greens, the Liberals, Labour, Conservative and SNP. So they their business manager sits in the Bureau and I chair it. And the votes are weighted. So that means that the SNP, uh, as the largest party, have you know, roughly 60 votes, a bit more than 60 votes. Um, the, uh, the Greens have five, Liberals have five, and so on. And that means that although we don't, we rarely, when we're discussing matters, have to divide, everybody knows that if it does come to a division, a vote, that the government would only need to support one other party to get its business agreed, whereas all the other opposition parties would have to come together to, to change business. So that's the, the, one of the dynamics in the, in, the, in the business. But it's, I'll be honest, we, we, we rarely do not agree, very, very rarely do not agree. And what happens is that we decide, the, the Bureau um, discusses, I should say, um, what the business programme should be. The government's got the mandate, they present through me, uh, they present uh, to the Bureau um, a proposed programme for the next three weeks. And then we discuss with all the business managers whether that's agreed, um, whether there should be additional statements, whether the time is long enough for each of the items and so on. And then on behalf of the Bureau, 
um, the business, one of the business managers, usually um, the, the, the Minister for Parliamentary Business, presents that to the Chamber and we vote on it. So the Parliament itself votes on the business. So that's how we decide what the agenda, what the political agenda is going to be in the sense of what we're going to debate. So a very important committee, one of the most important committees, which doesn't get much profile, but is crucial in de deciding what's debated in the Parliament. The other body is the corporate body. Now that's like the board of the Parliament, again, which I chair. It also has representatives of each of the political parties, but they're not weighted votes and they're not there to represent their parties. It's a far less, um, and it, it, it's not a party political committee at all. I mean, everything in the Parliament is political, just by its nature. Um, but the, the SPCB, the corporate body, it behaves in a far more, uh, far less partisan manner. And we'll decide all sorts of matters from um, uh, the catering tariffs, you know, the cost, the cost of a cup of coffee in the in the tea bar, to um, how much allowances uh, an MSP should get for the next session. Um, we have we spend an awful lot of time in things like um, we have, we had campers park, um, putting their tents outside the parliamentary estate for the best part of the first year I was presenting, in fact, almost two years as presenting officer, which took up an inordinate amount of time as we decided how we could get rid of them without while still protecting democracy. Um, so we have a number of, of roles. We, we also spend time on things like uh, whether should fly the EU flag. So, you know, these things are, as you might imagine, quite political, uh, but we approach them in a very um, uh, collegiate and parliamentary manner. It's a great, I have to say, it's a great body to sit on. Other roles I have, um, well, one of the roles that you won't see is that I decide on or make a decision on legislative competence of any bill. So any proposal that comes to the Parliament in terms of a bill, um, I will make a statement to the Parliament about whether or not the Parliament, whether the, the proposal is competent. Now, that's it's quite wi widely misunderstood. In, in reaching that decision, we've got a team of lawyers who work for the Parliament um, who spend an awful lot of time in this, and I take a lot of advice in these matters. Um, but making a decision on such a, on, on any bill, a proposed bill, um, does not mean it can't continue doesn't mean it's not a veto and a very good example of that very high profile example of that was the continuity bill uh, earlier in the session which um, uh, I took a view one of the I've, I've, I've taken a view in several bills that are not within competence but they tend to be um, private members bills for example there's a bill on corporate manslaughter another one on double parking and so on in which one of the proposals was, was not competent but these tend to be less controversial don't attract much attention but clearly the continuity bill is a very, very high profile bill and um, a very sensitive issue. Um, but the Parliament continued. I, I said it, it, it uh, ruled or, or gave a declaration that it might not be within our competence, but the Parliament continued as it's absolutely every right to. And then it would proceed through Parliament. And then uh, after Parliament, it was taken to court by the Advocate General. And uh, in fact, it was struck down by the court at that stage. So, but these processes are quite important and again they don't get much attention usually they only get attention when they go wrong <laughs> or when they become mired in in party politics uh, and as anton said earlier i also represent the parliament home and abroad so um one of the most i'll be honest one of the most pleasant aspects of the job i i, I welcome visitors you know president higgins from ireland was one of my first visitors fantastic auditor a real privilege to to welcome him but you know, all sorts of visitors to the parliament from all around the globe and from within the uk and similarly I represent the Parliament there. One of the most interesting developments over my time in office, and I think which will be increasingly important over the next few years, and again, we might return to this in question and answers, is the, the inter-parliamentary cooperation, which is now absolutely a necessity of parliamentary operations. You'll know, Des, that when, when the, the devolved settlement was first agreed, it was, it was a fairly black and white affair in the sense that there were Everything was de devolved except those issues which were held back. And it was a fairly clean cut. The economy was reserved, foreign affairs. Um, it was quite clear which side of the reserved devolved line everything lay. There have been subsequently two tranches of devolution and then the Brexit uh, bill. And what we have now is areas of joint competence, you know, taxation, social security, agriculture, so many. And what we're discovering is that with this need for common frameworks and what that in turn leads to is the need for greater inter-parliamentary cooperation. So all governments are accountable to their parliaments. So the Scottish government is accountable to the Scottish parliament, the UK government accountable to Westminster. And that means that inter-governmental relations are already well established. 
but there's not much inter-parliamentary uh, communication and relations. And, and that's something that's really developed certainly over my time in office and something I put a huge amount of emphasis, in, emphasis into. So I have, um, and in fact, as you might imagine, we have so much in common with uh, the Northern Ireland Assembly, now that it is sitting again, uh, with our Welsh uh, colleagues in the Senate, and with uh, Westminster. So um, uh, that's been a, a, a major development under uh, my term as presenting officer. And, and you know, there's, there's other aspects there. One of the um, more interesting ones is that I have, I have an audience with the Queen every year, just uh, which is, which is not me with a mic trying to entertain the Queen, by the way, it's actually me discussing parliamentary political affairs with her. And then there's other roles that, again, you might not know, the Parliament has its own think tank. It's called the Futures Forum, Scotland's Futures Forum. And uh, I chair that. So Scotland's Futures Forum is um, a chance for MSPs to come together in a, in, in a, in a forum that's out with the normal electoral cycle. The, the difficulty, as you might imagine, with elections every either four years or now every five years, is that there's always a manifesto, there are always commitments and there are always positions to take. And it can be quite difficult to think of issues without immediately dropping into party positions on these issues. And if you think of the, of the big issues facing us, whether they be, you know, environment or um, uh, dementia or you know, just some of the long term issues that we need to tackle, these go way beyond the four or five years election cycle. And the Futures Forum is really good for allowing MSPs to come together and um, to have your know, blue sky thinking or just a, a way to discuss matters without falling out about it and um, being very, very productive. Although it's always difficult for members, you're always trying to make demands on members' time, they just don't have enough time to go around. But that's a that's a, a really, a really interesting organization that brings together the universities. We have so much input from the universities, uh, as Glasgow, um, into the into the forum and uh, produces some really good paper and some uh, papers and some interesting ideas. Um, Des, I'll, I'll probably stop there because I, I, like most politicians, I could talk forever about my job, but I know that you, you, you probably want to ask questions. So, uh, and I've given you an introduction to the, the role of the PO and we can take it from there if that's okay. No, that's, that's great, Ken. I mean, that's a fantastic overview of the, the role and I, I recognise so much of it uh, over the period. You did mention as you're going through that uh, in 1999, there was a strong commitment to greater accessibility to political decision making and making many more opportunities available for civil society to participate in the legislative and deliber deliberative process. Mm -hmm. Do you think that promise has actually been achieved? Do you think the Parliament has actually delivered on, 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 on the, those commitments? And, and how has that kind of evolved through time? Yes, well, it, it certainly did to begin with. There is absolutely no doubt that we were at the, the forefront of this whole development back in 99. And, and I still remember to this day the, the expressions from all around the country from different community groups, business leaders, trade unions, that they had access to the decision makers at long last and how welcome this was. Um, and as you, you'll know, the petitions, petitions uh, system we introduced in the problem was the first anywhere in the UK. Um, and so we were very, very much at the forefront of all of this. And then what happened? Well, uh, it's difficult to describe exactly, but what we discovered, and this is something that I certainly, my predecessor actually, Tricia Marwick did too, and then I picked up, uh, took up the cudgels after she left, that you have to refresh, you have to constantly reinvent these processes. Otherwise, they either go stale or, or, or they get taken for granted. Um, and so what we discovered is that, you know, um, well, Westminster, for example, you know, came up, looked at our system and thought, yeah, this is a great idea. They, they introduced a system where if you get 100,000 votes, you have a, a debate, guaranteed debate in, in the Chamber Hall at Westminster. I mean, Westminster Hall. You know, real innovations at Westminster, really almost leapfrogging the Scottish Parliament. So one of the things that I was very keen to do when I came in was um, was to reform and refresh the Parliament. So I didn't want to go back to first principles. I didn't want to reinvent the principles in which we're founded, but I did want to refocus them to make sure we hadn't lost our way and we'd remembered what we're all about. And it, I was very gratified that one of the most important reforms, set of reforms, came out of the reform process. So just to to um, refresh your memory, I set up an independent commission on parliamentary reform. Uh, got John McCormick very kindly agreed to chair it. It had representatives of the political parties, but a majority of re representatives from outs out with parliament. Uh, again, reflecting that um, relationship that we should be sharing power with the people of Scotland. It's not for us to dictate to the people of Scotland. 
and it came up with a, a series of reforms, and some of the most important, and certainly in terms of the financial investment of the parliament, the most important investment was in uh, the, engage the committee engagement unit, the new forms of uh, participation that we've put in place, uh, citizens' duties, or, or other, all sorts of forms of engaging with communities all around Scotland. It, it's happened, in fact, at a time when we're not the only ones doing this thing. A lot of people's eyes were drawn to Ireland and the very uh, prominent success of uh, citizens' assemblies in helping the process of changing the laws on, on abortion in Ireland. And, and a, a, such a difficult, tricky subject that was made not made easier, but certainly it was, uh, it was the public were engaged in it. It wasn't imposed on them. And uh, the Scottish government set up a very similar system here, which has just deliberated. And, and uh, so you can see that we're not the only body looking at these matters. But, but I was very encouraged by this, the, the, this, these whole new ways. And we've got a number of electronic ways too now. And um, the one, not the one upside, but a very big upside from the pandemic is it has entirely transformed the way we conduct our business in terms of virtual working. And that has had huge benefits in terms of accessing remote communities and so on. So um, it's, it's difficult to know what happened between 99 and the current day, but I am uh, certainly encouraged that we're back, we're, we're back again um, with this idea to the forefront that we constantly need to engage, that we're not the, you know, uh, the font of all wisdom, that quite the reverse, we are a representative democracy that's trying to practice participative democracy, and we need to work at it. Oh, I think that's 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 a great answer, Ken, and and the idea of the evolutionary process and and, and trying to to learn as you go and, and find new ways of doing things, I think, is really important. Mm -hmm. Just going back over the history of the Parliament, I mean, obviously, the first two um, governments were. Labour, Liberal Democrat coalitions, and then since then you've had uh, three periods of, of SNP government. Um, you know, one minority and, and, and or two minorities and, and a majority SNP government. How how do you think the Parliament has evolved in that sense? I mean, ha has you know the SNP being in power made a difference? Have they got a different style compared with what went before? And 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 how do you see that evolution in in who's who's in government affecting the way in which the Parliament works? Uh, well, a, a great question because I can tell you that the each each session of Parliament has had its own distinct identity, very clear identity, um, and the identity reflects. The political makeup of the parliament it's as simple as that so um again des you'll remember that so the first two sessions were both um were both coalitions formal coalitions between the labor and the liberal democrat groups and in some ways they were actually majority governments because there was a formal coalition that had a guaranteed uh, well guaranteed if the liberal democrats always voted with labor which didn't always happen but uh, in fact the liberal democrats didn't always vote with the liberal democrats i think was the issue it might be political here at this point. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It's historical, so. Um, uh, but it was it was a, a coalition. But even then, the, the the second parliament that was the Rainbow Parliament, where we had six parties. So Labour's numbers went down in that parliament, but actually the the, the coalition still dominated because the opposition were more diverse. We had the huge numbers of uh, Scottish Socialists, um, plus the rise of the Greens at that point, and it was a more diverse group. Um, so that, that rainbow parliament had a different character to the first one, although it's still coalition. I still think that the most important um, moment in the, the, the maturity of the parliament, as it were, was the formation, the successful formation of a minority government in 2007 by the SNP under Alex Salmond. I think switching from a government that was also in power at Westminster to another party and to a minority administration at that, um, because that, I mean, that could have just fallen apart. That could have not survived the four years. It could have fallen at the first hurdle. But what that, what the government proved is that a you can govern with a minority. Um, that that actually the way to do it is essentially if you get your budget bill through, then everything else falls into place. It's quite it's quite interesting. That it was a real lesson. Um, and when you go into the political dynamics of how it worked, but it was a, it was a really really important development for me. Um, in 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 the in the evolution of the parliament. Then we had a majority SNP government. Now, I think it's fair to say that that tested the 
the checks and balances of the parliament itself. The, the parliament was designed on a voting system and with all sorts of systems in place that were based on the assumption that no party would ever have a majority. And yet here we had an absolute majority and it, it undoubtedly could have left, led to all sorts of, um, well, of difficulties for the parliament itself as an institution. What happened was when the when the SME government came in, they, they recognised this right away. And so, for example, they didn't in, impose um, the, uh, their um, convenership on every on every committee, which they could have done, and you know they could have taken a majority on every single committee and just dominated everything, uh, and that didn't happen. So that was I think <laughs> probably wise politically, but um, but it definitely challenged the systems, the checks and balances within the system, and now we've got a a minority, but a very large minority, um, and uh, again each one of these parliaments has had quite a different character. But if I may say so, the, the, the bigger dynamics in Parliament have been really outside that. I think that the Parliament itself has shown itself able to adapt to each of these different electoral arithmetics. And it, it's required, you know, it has required to adapt in each situation. The, 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 the move to virtual working alone in this session is, is one of them. But perhaps more important over the big, the, the big picture have been a number of other factors. So for example, the key to the first two sessions was the growth of the economy and the growth of public spending. So we were living through times when we could introduce free bus passes, free personal care for the elderly. You know, it was a growing time, huge expansion in public services, investment in education and the NHS, which I have no doubt helped establish the Scottish Parliament as a successful institution because people could see what it was delivering. A much more difficult time since the crash of 2007 2008 you know austerity economics and um, just cuts in public services has meant a, diff a different agenda and that has that i think has shaped the political agenda more than than, than the, the 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 parliament itself or its procedures and then on top of that there have been other factors externally um the brexit referendum the pandemic the me too movement other things like the rise of populism the rise of nationalism globally. I mean, big issues, which you can see not just in this country, but afar, they've really also shaped the agenda. So, and I think it's probably fair to say that they've been more important than just internal processes in the parliament itself, because the parliament itself is quite a flexible institution and has matured and, um, and, I, and I hope responded to developments. Um, I maybe pursue you a bit on the maturity issue. So, I mean, some of the innovations that you talked about um, I mean, examples might be the introduction of financial scrutiny happened quite early on in, 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 in the parliament. Um, I think if you go back to the 2007 to 2011 SNP minority government, there was actually relatively little legislation during that period because obviously, you know, the government, government didn't actually have the votes to make sure they could actually secure uh, control of, of the legislation, which led to some very interesting results like the, the 2009 climate change bill, which was quite different from, from the bill that, bill that, that, was, that was introduced. Um, but, you know, have we matured in terms of our understanding of what the parliament is for? And do, do you think there's been a learning process by the parliamentarians themselves about how to use the, the instruments that they've got at their, their disposal? Do you, do you get a sense that the institution and those people in it have, have, have got a more mature understanding than they had in the earlier period? Um, it, I'll be honest, it, 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 it changes, or, and it changes all the time. The, one, of, one of my biggest regrets, and one of the things we tried to address in the Commission for Parliamentary Reform was how to hold on to experienced parliamentarians, people who'd served as, perhaps served as ministers um, and moved to the back benches, um, most most leave, you know, very rare do people stay on. At Westminster, you can go on, you can become, it's a much bigger institution, there's more space, you can become chair of a select committee, or you can be an independent, robust voice on the back benches. In the Scottish Parliament, I mean, the, the list that Anton read out earlier, the people that are leaving, you know, people like, you know, Alec Neil and, um, or even just people like Adam Tompkins, um, uh, you know, Joanne uh, Lamont, uh, Lamont, um, Lamont. I'm, so many people mispronounce a name that affects me. Joanne Lamont is her name, not Norman Lamont. So, um, yeah, the, the, we find it difficult to hold on to people with that um, uh, with that experience and 
um, that ability to um, the institutional memory almost of, of, of earlier sessions and how to use uh, parliamentary um, procedures to their advantage. But then again, the fresh intake learn very quickly. They learn immediately how to use it. So, so I'm not, you know, there's a downside, there's a big upside. Refreshing the parliament is so important. This particular intake, we had, you know, 50, 51 uh, new or returned MSPs. It made such a difference. It was almost like 99 again, with this whole new fresh intake with people with energy, enthusiasm, determination, drive, you know, and it and it really did um, shake up the parliament in a really, really positive way. And, you know, most of them learned really quickly how to use the parliament to good effect. Um, and I think that, you know, good politicians, good parliamentarians work with what's in front of them. They work with the tools that are there. So, um, so, they, so they learn, and, and if they're frustrated by one thing, they, they learn others. One of, one of the big changes I've tried to introduce certainly is to give parliamentary MSPs the opportunity to speak. There were times in, when I was a, 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 an MSP as a, as a, a you know, backbencher or frontbencher, whatever else, when I was very frustrated by the inability to get the chance to stand up in the chamber and ask a question or make a contribution, just it was so time limited. It's 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 the as you know, Des, we have a, a time a, a family friendly parliament. Decision times at five, and everything's time limited because of that, which is a real plus. But it means that trying to get your slots are, it can be difficult. The, one of the major aspects of reform I've introduced is the ability now for so many more question opportunities. So members, if they have a topical and interesting and urgent, a pressing issue, there will be an opportunity every single week usually every single day, but every single week, they'll have an opportunity to make that point. And I, and I make sure that's the case. So people learn, people learn how to use um, the procedures that are there in front of them. I wish we could hold on to parliamentarians more. Um, there's no easy way to do this. It's not a big parliament. Um, so um, I think that's something for future, you know, for future. And, and, and I would also point out that one of the hopes of, one of the early hopes of the first parliament was that it would usher in a new form of, um, collegiate politics, more cross-party politics. Now, that, that it, it's still, we still have the hemispheric chamber, we still have the small committees with a more collegiate way of working, but people vote down party lines and parties get things done. You know, parties are, you know, aggregations of interest that get things done. They are, they are the vehicles in which politics is, is run. So I've got nothing against parties, but they dominate. They absolutely dominate the Scottish Parliament. And that, um, so the hope that we would have slightly more independent minded people has really been pushed out by that. But that's just that is just a reflection of the world in which we live in, I think, where people, you know, if people want to vote for independent minded people, they can do so. They tend to vote for parties and therefore we get a party dominated system. So, I mean, obviously, there's been, you know, the recent controversy about uh, the handling of complaints about the former first minister. Alex Salmond, I, I won't ask you to, to talk explicitly about that, but let me ask you about the concerns that have been raised about the effectiveness of members of parliament to hold government to account. Um, you know, in these circumstances, you've had a lot of people in the press, you know, David Davis, you know, raising issues about whether the Scottish Parliament is suffering from a deficit of power in relation to investigating ministers. Um, Perhaps you've got some some thoughts about that from your 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 position just now, very close to it. Yes, well, as you might imagine, it is a, a very sensitive issue. I'm not going to comment on the the politics of it. There's, it it's been a very very challenging inquiry. This uh, the, the the committee into the government's Scottish government handling of harassment complaints. Very challenging. Very difficult for everybody concerned. And I, I think it's fair to say that nobody has come out of this um, very well in the sense that the women at the heart of it have been very very unhappy uh, and continue to be unhappy and uh, very distressed by the way their complaints have been dealt with. Um, but not only that, the, the institutions themselves, the government, the parliament, the crown office, the courts, I mean, the, there have been a lot of, um, a lot of uh, certainly accusations or charges levelled and, and, you know, and some truth in some of them. However, I would, I would rebut the fact that uh, the, the, the Parliament has not um, been able to exercise its scrutiny function. I, I think quite the reverse. I think, um, in fact, it's interesting because the, the papers today had a, 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 an interview. I did an interview a few days ago before um, the, the, 
the leaks of the weekend. Um, but I stand by the truth of the of what I was saying, which is that the, the committee has shone a light on the inner workings of government. You know, we I, I don't think I've ever seen a committee inquiry which has revealed more about the way that governments reach their decisions, you know, about the meetings that take place, the, the way that ministers relate to the civil servants, the way they relate to the special advisors, their spas, the way they relate to the parliament, the way their, their uh, law officers give them advice, the external legal advice they get, the relationship with the Crown Office, the relationship with the courts. All of this, all of this has been explored in the utmost detail. Now, there's a lot of frustration around for lots of understandable reasons, and there's a huge amount at stake. There's an election in a few weeks' time, and the participants at the heart of this are, you know, two of the biggest figure of, uh, they, they shouldn't be at the heart of it, but the two, of, two of the protagonists are, are two of the most well-known politicians in Scotland. So there's, there's a huge amount of political tension here. So I'm not surprised there's a lot of frustration, but I would absolutely deny that the, 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 the committee has not been able to uh, carry out its, its scrutiny. The, the, um, the view, and, and the parliament has used all its powers. The parliament has used section 23 powers for the first time ever, several times. The parliament then, you might deprecate the use of a, a vote of no confidence, but you know, it, members, when faced with a difficulty, used a vote of no confidence to get more information from the government. The, the first minister appeared for eight hours, the former first minister appeared for six and a half hours before the committee. I, I defy anybody to name a government around the world which has been you know, brought before its parliament for an eight hour interrogation, you know. So I, I, I think that the parliament absolutely has. The fact that it hasn't reached a resolution that is to the satisfaction of all is a different matter. That's about the politics of it. Well, it's not about the politics, but that is a political judgment, as it were. But I certainly don't think the parliament has failed in its in its in its function. Um, and but it's been but it's been a difficult. And I think there will be lessons to be learned. I think um, what I would suggest, however, is that perhaps in the middle of the of the discussion around the the, the, the report's findings might not be the best time to just immediately reflect on them. It might be wise to let um, tempers and perhaps the election to cool things off and then we'll reflect on, on, on how we can learn from this. Thanks Ken. I suppose one of the interesting issues here is whether the kind of he said she said aspects of, of, of the inquiry um, to some extent take away from some of the governance issues so mm -hmm. you know the role of the civil service and, and, and the way in which the you know, the procedure was developed and the, the case was then, then then handled. Do you think that to, to some extent inquiries are a blunt instrument because people are looking for, if you like, the, the, the kind of the hanging point uh, or otherwise, you know, in relation to, to, the, to the politician most, most closely affected? Or do you think that the, you know, the, the, the committee and the committees of the parliament can actually get into the, the mechanics of how the governance issues are actually are actually operating, even in that kind of context. Well, I do think, um, I, I, as you might imagine, um, you know, 22 years now, I, I've seen a number of committee inquiries uh, in operation, and some of them are formidable and fantastic, produce uh, really good results, nearly always, where the members come together collectively, there's something incredibly powerful when you get a cross-party committee of inquiry coming together across all groups with the evidence from external sources, from whatever body it is, and producing a report. And uh, you can see that in all sorts of ways. I mean, even just currently at the moment, um, in, in this current parliament, the, 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 the mesh, the, 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 the women who have um, suffered from the complications of transvaginal mesh have had champions in uh, Neil Findlay, Alec Neil, and Jackson Carlo, you know, three more <laughs> politically <laughs> disparate figures you could not get, but they've come together. That's not even within the committee, but it just shows you. And there's all sorts of committee inquiries that have been successful. However, um, there are also other committees which have uh, inquiries which have not been so, and it's quite interesting that the ones, the more, the more quasi judicial they appear, sometimes um, the more. Uh, uh, attention or the more uh, the more frustration they attract so I remember very vividly the fingerprint inquiry mm -hmm. um, and I can I can tell you I mean I won't go back into that one I was incredibly disappointed by the fingerprint inquiry incredibly disappointed mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I think that was actually on, on both sides of of that particular uh, debate and um, just for those who can't remember there was a 
is it, this that was about a, a, a policewoman, Shirley McKee, who well, it was about a murder initially. A uh, policewoman, Shirley McKee, who had been uh, put in trial for perjury for being at the scene of the crime, was acquitted. And then um, the issue was about whether a fingerprint had been the scene of crime, and the whole issue of fingerprints was called into question. Um, and as a result, a whole lot of fingerprint officers who I represented um, lost their jobs, which I thought was disgraceful. Um, and, and the Committee of Inquiry shone a light on it, but it didn't come to a satisfactory conclusion. And similar to, to this, and I think that that shows the strengths and the weaknesses. It is not a judicial inquiry. So it, it's not a case where, for example, witnesses, they might give evidence on oath, but they're not cross-examined in a court. It's a political inquiry and people go around and you have maybe a couple of questions each. So you don't get to cross-examine witnesses like that. And they are representatives of political parties. So there's nothing to stop any member of that committee expressing a view out with the committee. Um, but what it does do, the big strength is it puts the issue off the day center stage and it shines a light on it. So it allows all views. And that, I think that is, the, that is the strength of all parliaments and the strength of all committees. You take the issue of the day and you are able to discuss it in our national forum and you can hear all views and all views are aired. And then in many ways, it's up to the public to make up their minds what they think. Because in this inquiry before us now, you have heard everything, I think. I mean, I know that there are some court orders in place which stop the identification of certain people. But most people will be in no doubt about what's been happening generally, and people can come to their own view because they've heard it discussed and they've heard various versions of it. And I think that's where Parliament is at its strongest, just discussing, literally just discussing the issue and allowing people to put their version of events, their interpretation of events, uh, to give their evidence and to allow other people to, to make the conclusion. Sometimes the committee will come to a unanimous um, uh, conclusion and it will have huge impetus and force. Other times it'll just air the arguments, it'll be up to the public. One of the, the kind of complaints I think of MSPs is how unfair journalists can be to them, um, which I think, you know, is, is something we, we, we all have to, to deal with. But I think my personal view is, is that across the parties, there's a lot of talent in, in, the, in the parliament and a lot of capable people and sometimes who, who, who are badly underestimated having worked with, with, with a large number of, of MSPs. Um, but how would we, in a sense, encourage more people to put themselves forward and, and try to improve the, the, the quality and, and preparedness of people to go in, into the parliament? H how would you persuade people this, this was a good thing to do, bearing in mind the, the journalistic pressure and, 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 and the, the time constraints and all, all the other downsides of, of being in politics? That's right. I mean, the, 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 you won't need me to, to list the many things that put people off going into politics. Um, and um, the, 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 an antagonistic or aggressive press is just one of them. And I, we have quite an aggressive press, but I mean, the alternative of not having a, a, a robust press, if we put it that way, a robust press would be worse. You know, to have some sort of timid, supine, you know, lapdog press that just printed whatever we wanted. I mean, that would be ridiculous. We, you want to be challenged. And so I think um, just put that to one side. You know, I, I, I like the press. Uh, unless, of course, I'm the focus of attention, which I don't like that. But <laughs> yeah, no, the, um, uh, yeah I, I, I've tried to do what I can from a parliamentary perspective to encourage people to come forward. Because again, one of the, one of the huge victories of 99 was that we broke what I thought was we broke the gender barrier. We had this parliament in which we had 37% of our intake were women. And it totally transformed the look of a modern parliament. So you had Westminster at the time, which had, I can't remember, did I have 17 women at the time? Or something like that? Maybe not 17, but it was tiny numbers out of 650. And here we were, we were the second, in terms of gender equality, we were the second most gender representative parliament in the world at the time. Um, but if you look at how, again, we've changed over 20 years, we have not made progress. You know, all the other parliaments have, have over, overtaken us or certainly caught us up, and we've stalled. We haven't made the progress because there are so many uh, barriers to women, to people of colour, to uh, people with disabilities entering parliament. It is a difficult and hostile environment for a lot of people. And if there are any other factors such as you know, the misogyny that women just experience every single day eh, on social media and elsewhere that put you off, then, then we need to do something to tackle that. And as presenting officer, 
Uh, the parliament can do some things. Uh, a lot of it is in the hands of the political parties who select their candidates and who, who should be doing more to encourage a, a more diverse group of candidates to come forward. But I've certainly done, done what I can. There have been a number of projects, in fact, within the parliament. Young Women Lead, Scotland Women Stand, which are all about encouraging women to come forward. I had a, a, a couple of events um, for underrepresented communities in which we invited them into parliament, underrepresented uh, communities to come in uh, as potential candidates to see what it would be like, to make them feel confident, to tell, give them an idea of what it would be like being an MSP. Uh, I went out to um, a place like Mary Hill just to speak to various ethnic communities, again, with a very specific message. And we've also targeted parliamentary posts. This is for the parliamentary service, the staff who work at the parliament deliberately targeted at, you know, advertised in uh, newspapers and other groups that we so we could increase um, our representation ourselves as, as a parliament in terms of staff from, again, for underrepresented groups. So we can, we can do so much more, but we need to do more because politics is, the, the parliament I still think is a family friendly institution. It's still got a lot of the anchors that keep it that way, including as I say, the decision time at five, which keeps the hours uh, centred. We still have Mondays and Fridays protected constituency days. And a, a lot of these principles are still there. But we need to do more than that. We need to, um, we need to have essentially positive action in, in certain areas to, um, to overcome the barriers that, that stop people coming forward. Social media alone, we are living in such divisive times and social media is so angry, it's so full of rage and that spills over into the parliament all the time. It's, politics are incredibly divisive at the moment. So we absolutely need to have some form of either regulation of social media or the anonymity of social media needs to be removed because it is, it is unacceptable it, it, and it is absolutely putting people off. Um, parliament possibly could do more, um, but I think the political parties and through their regulatory actions could definitely do more. So you said at the outset that when you came into post as presiding officer that you, in a sense, wanted to shake things up and you did, you know, take various initiatives, including the, the commission to, to, to look at uh, parliamentary procedures. Um, and I think that's actually been very positive development. What advice would you give to your successor? You know, the, 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 next, the next person to become presiding officer. What, what, what do you think that if, if you were coming into that, and, and obviously you won't be, but were you coming into that, what, what should they be looking at? Um, well, first of all, I'm not going to give my successor any advice because uh, I think, you know, uh, I think it would almost certainly be either patronizing or condescending or whatever else. And I've no doubt that they will have their own ideas. Um, uh, I would, I would hope that they would um, come into it with, with a clear view right from, the, right from the start. Sometimes you need, to, you need to start things from day one. You know, a year in is actually too late sometimes. Even though it can take you a year to grow into the job, by that point, people have, they've got your measure as well as you might have theirs. And actually it can be quite difficult to turn things around at that stage. So, you know, hit the ground running is, is, is what I'd hope for them. But I'm, I won't be telling them that. I'll just be hoping they do that. Um, they'll certainly face some challenges. Um, I, I, I hope they continue to push forward with the, the programs that do include diversity. I hope that they challenge, they do what they can to promote the, um, the, the virtues and the principles on which the parliament is founded, which is this participatory accessible culture to continue even, even in a world which is dominated by political parties to, to continue to support collegiate um, forms of working. I think they'll have big decisions about, um, about the use of technology. We, um, in the pandemic, um, we, uh, one of our big, I suppose you, you could say successes, but certainly uh, 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 one of the changes we made was to become a, a virtual parliament. And uh, it, it has a big upside. You, you have uh, the ability to, um, participate from quite remote locations around Scotland, uh, not just the MSPs, but the, the, the communities in, in a, you know, far easier now. All the, all the committee rooms are set up to do this. Um, so it's, it's, it's almost seen as a, a normal part of business. Um, vote, because of that, voting numbers have gone up um, just in terms of the MSPs. You know, so so and, and there's no, no MSP is disenfranchised at any stage. No matter where they are, their community that they represent will have their vote at any stage. But the difficulty with it is that um, 
politics is a very interpersonal business. And if you just take the obvious thing of when you're working with a virtual chamber, you cannot have uh, interventions or interruptions. You know, so we've got, we've got a, normally we work with a hybrid, which is you have your real chamber and you have your virtual chamber and they work simultaneously um, and usually through the presenting officer, but it means you can't have interventions. It, those in the chamber, the real chamber can intervene in each other and have a debate, a discussion, take interventions and give them. Those in the virtual format can't because they'd have to come through the presiding officer and, and that's not my role. I can't, I can't say, will you take an intervention from Des McNulty? You know, that's not my role. Um, so, so it loses something. And more than that, you lose, by people being remote, you lose um, the nature of politics. Politics is not just transactional. It's not just about questions and answers. It's about interrelations. It's about persuasion. It's about the human touch. It's about meet, meeting, making friends and colleagues across party lines and making alliances and little conversations and over cups of coffee and so on. These things so matter to politics and they don't really work on Zoom, frankly. So um, so the new presenting officer will have big decisions to make about, uh, along with the whole parliament, we'll just speak for the presenting officer, but about in what circumstances to use the technology, not going to uninvent it, it's been a big boon, but what circumstances can they use it? So it would be a big advantage to women uh, who are, have got, I mean, this is a point made by several colleagues who have been stepping down. It would allow them access to the parliament. But would that be the only criteria you would use? Yet you have to work out, you know, if you, um, for example, there's been a lot of votes, a lot of discussion around proxy voting. There, there, there's swings and roundabouts these things. If you have proxy votes, you're essentially giving your vote to somebody else quite often the whips. Yeah, that just dominates. That just means the party, the party system dominates even more. So there's, there are, there are always downsides when you introduce changes like this. So you have to be careful about it. Um, but yes, I think, I think there'll be uh, any number of of challenges. Can I just also point out that the the biggest challenge that the the, the new presenting officer will face will be something that we don't know yet. You know, when I came in, we had uh, we just had a new tranche of devolution. We had tax raising powers and social security powers, and we thought that would dominate. Six weeks after we were elected. The Brexit referendum happened, <laughs> so and it, it totally shaped the political agenda for four years, followed by a global pandemic. You know, so whatever advice you might have, you know, was it was it to Har Harold Macmillan said, "Events, dear boy, events." You know, that's that's what you have to handle. Yeah, when the Parliament was set up in 1999, and for a good few years afterwards, there was a kind of endless flow of people coming from around the world to to look at, you know. The parliament how the parliament was working i think a lot of people came to, to see the new building as well and see see how that that worked um how do you think the scottish parliament is now viewed internationally you must meet a lot of people who are coming to the parliament to who express their their, their views yes uh, uh, well very positively is the straight answer um, although, although I suppose to be fair, they're not going to meet me and tell me how much they dislike the Scottish Parliament. But uh, even even with that, even with the diplomatic niceties to one side, um, yes, we are viewed very positively, and, and in fact, we engage. But we the, the way the Scottish Parliament engages with other parliaments is always on a, a, a reciprocal, a mutual learning basis. We are always looking to other parliaments to learn. Um, there are there are particular um, parliaments, in fact, which are very helpful to us because of the similarities. So the German lander um, in particular, uh, New Zealand, the Canadian Canadian national and uh, uh, state uh, legisl legislatures, Belgium, because of it's the nature of the devolved powers in Belgium. So there are some which have, and, and of course, <laughs> above all of these, closer to home, Wales and Northern Ireland, as well as Westminster. So, so we have very, very, close interaction. And it's quite interesting that during the pandemic, we were swapping information about, you know, how do you adjust the pandemic? What kind of voting system can we introduce? What kind of remote voting um, are you going to use? You know, what technology will you use? How do you make it work? How do you, how do you establish security in such, such, such circumstances? And in fact, security more generally in a time when parliamentarians are often under physical threat, how do you guarantee their safety and so on? We're always swapping ideas and exchanging information. Um, and I think there's no doubt that um, many look to us. Um, the, the ones I've mentioned there tend to be um, um, equal partners, if I can put it that way, and we're, we're exchanging information back and forward. There are others where we take a more um, supportive role, particularly in emerging, emerging democracies. And that's where 
we are more likely, for example, to devote resources. So um, it might be in the Balkans, it might be in um, North Africa, um, well, there's quite a few countries in, in, in parts of Pakistan where we actually devote considerable resources to working with colleagues in these parliaments to talk about institutions. You mentioned earlier, Des, for example, the Financial Scrutiny Unit. Well, the Kosovan parliament thought this was so good they've adopted it and we actually sent somebody there and they, they, they because, you know, for those who don't know, the, the government, when they're producing budgets, uh, has the whole uh, armory of the civil service behind them. Parliaments um, uh, and political parties within that are, are at a disadvantage. There's, there's no equality of arms, if we can use that in military metaphor I'm, I'm using at the moment. Uh, and what the Scottish Parliament did was it set up the Financial Scrutiny Unit to provide neutral financial information available to everybody on which you can make judgments uh, through a budget process. It's incredibly helpful to... Uh, I was an opposition politician at the time, very helpful to me uh, when I was on the front bench. Um, and the Kosovan Parliament has adopted that and uh, we helped set them up. Um, uh, an identical unit to help them proper uh, ensure proper parliamentary scrutiny. And I think one of the things that struck me when I met people from other parliaments is that whereas I think the assumption in Britain is that Westminster is the mother of all parliaments and the you know the the model that that people copy. In fact, the Scottish Parliament is much more similar to, to the way parliaments work in the rest of the world than, than Westminster is. Westminster is out on a limb um, and, and the Scottish Parliament is actually much more typical and people can learn more in, in various ways from the Scottish Parliament. Having said that, one of the criticisms of the Scottish Parliament is the lack of a revising chamber or some kind of revising mechanism uh, so that mistakes or, or expertise, um, in a sense, can be applied in, at a post-legislative or as part of the legislative process. Is there anything that you think could be done to, to, to provide some kind of a, a check on, on, on errors that the Parliament might, might make or... or, or issues that might be resolved by some kind of revising mechanism? Yeah, this is a, a recurring issue um, for us and has been for many years now without, without one uh, easy solution. So if, if you take the idea of a second chamber, that idea has come up time and time again. Um, the, the, the political reality of it is, is that, you know, there, there's very few and people in the electorate who would vote for more politicians. So, you know, the idea of a party standing, say we, we are going to create a second chamber with another level of politicians, probably not going down as the most electorally popular idea. Um, however, if it's the right thing to do, you know, maybe it will be adopted at some stage. Um, what we did, of course, this session was that we actually specifically introduced post, a post-legislative legislative function for what was what used to be called the... Uh, um, used to be called the, what's the, the old name for DPLR? Um, oh, I've forgotten the name now, it's terrible. The, it, it, it used to be the committee that all, it was still is the committee that scrutinizes all subordinate legislation. Sub, it was called subordinate legislation, subledge. Yeah. I don't know if you ever stood in it, I, I sat in that committee for many years and I really, really liked working on that committee, although it, was, <laughs> it wasn't everybody's idea of fun. Uh, but it, it now has a specific post legislative scrutiny function and uh, one that takes seriously. So we've got a committee that specifically has an eye on this area. But the committees themselves are supposed to be the vehicle that provide the, 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 the sort of second chamber function. And the, the difficulty, the, when the committees are working at their best, that's what they do. When the electoral arithmetic doesn't work in their favor, that's where they're at their weakest. So, um, there are still, what, what I was greatly encouraged by in this session was that, for example, for the first time in many years, we saw a committee bill come through. It's a, it's a bit of a niche issue for many. It's the, uh, the, uh, the study of the, the pre-release of statistics. So as you'll, you may know, when a government uh, um, has figures coming out, the government gets them in advance, sometimes, uh, well, sometimes a week in advance before they issue them. So the government ministers get to look at them and the allegation is that they then present the statistics in the most favorable light. Um, and other legislatures say, no, everyone should have access and produce the statistics, statistics should go to everybody at the same time. Um, a committee bill just came forward and came up with a proposal. It, it was a compromise said, that, well, the, the maximum government should have them is one day in advance. And the government opposed this until the end and then agreed, but it went through as a committee bill with the support of all the opposition parties and then the government abstained at the end. 
obviously I was so encouraged just to see a committee bill like that come through again. Um, because that's 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 the committee for parliament is doing its work, you know, exercising um, independent function. This was not a party political point. It was something that was supported by the, the broader community. There was no votes in it. You know, it was just a, 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 a the, the right thing to do. But it was also the process. I really liked the fact that the committees did it. So the committees in the parliament do have the power. They can exercise it. They can exercise that uh, post legislative function. But it's not easy. And parties still dominate and uh yeah it's 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 still um it, it's going to be it's going to remain an issue which will require attention for for time to come one of the things that i think is most satisfying uh, to have done as a member is actually to bring forward a private members bill and in that sense kind of take on your own issue and and uh, and, and drive it through the parliament i was fortunate enough to be able to do that with asbestos related issues but you made the point, which is right, that you can only do that in a sense with the support of colleagues on a cross-party basis. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it is something that the Parliament does, which is often not particularly recognised. Um, and there, there, is, there is very, some very significant differences in Scottish public life that have come about through private members' bills. Is that something that we should be publicising more or, or kind of say more about as 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 as, as a function of, of, of the parliament the extent to which members can actually lead debate and, and take take forward issues that affect their constituents well it, it is again you, you you're shining a light on one of the what you call a hidden gem or certainly one of the functions of the parliament that that i think is is really important but they these issues they tend to be on the most not always but they tend to be relatively um discrete issues so your own bill on asbestos, I, as you know, I did a similar one for on skin cancer, which is about control of sunbeds, but it's just about raising awareness of skin cancer. And in my case, my success was 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 based on the fact that the government, the incoming SNP government, took on the bill. So mine was adopted into law, and that made it so much easier because it's it's still difficult to get a private members bill through a members bill. It's very difficult to do. But if you just look tomorrow, we're going to debate uh, Andy Whiteman's bill on the. Um, uh, European uh, European Convention on Local Government. So basically, it's a European agreement about devolving power to local government level, and that's likely to go through. I mean, I don't want to predict it, but it, I think it's as well. It's got to stage three. I think it will go through tomorrow. Um, and then the next day, uh, Emma Harper's bill on um, the uh, protection of livestock from from dogs is another bill that's likely to go through. So they're quite well. And Andy Whiteman's bill is quite broad ranging. Actually, it's really quite a. Um, it's it's, it's really putting the principle of subsidiarity into law in Scotland. So, so you know, you can have quite far-reaching effects, and it is important, and it does require, it's certainly, these bills absolutely reflect the ethos in which the Parliament was founded. It tends to take a member with quite a lot of drive, quite a lot of um, <laughs> willingness to, to make it their issue, to, to make it happen. Well, you know, you've done it yourself. You know how much work that takes. You know, when you haven't got a civil service behind you, getting a bill through Parliament is immensely difficult. There's so many obstacles in your way, and we have tried to um, uh, re uh, uh, to, to to obviously refinance to beef up our non um, uh, non governmental bills unit to make it to give it the resources to uh, to help members in that situation. And we had a lot of members' bills coming through. As usual, only half of them made it to the final stage because it's so difficult. It's so difficult to get this done. But yeah, it is. It, it doesn't tend to address the big issues. They tend to be matters for government still, but on specific issues, they absolutely capture the essence of um, participative democracy because they tend to be driven by somebody out with parliament who then takes a, gets a member like yourself to mm. take, take, take this issue and run with it. And then you win support from across the parties and it requires cross-party support. It tends to be members in opposition, not always, there's a couple of government members in it too, but uh, yeah, it's a... It's, uh, it's a big plus of our parliament. I don't know whether it's happened in the Scottish Parliament, but obviously at Westminster during the Brexit debate, John Burko's position became very politicised in, in, in a sense, and, and he took decisions that the, the, the government clearly disagreed with at, at the time and presented himself as, you know, in a sense, representing uh, the parliament more generally and, 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 and its traditions. Is that something that could happen in the Scottish Parliament or, you know, would you like to see the presiding officer in that kind of situation? Um, 
is it is it imaginable in in, in the Scottish parliamentary context, or, or is it something that should be avoided at all costs? Um, well, it's it's highly imaginable, and it's the stuff of my nightmare days, and it has been for several years. Uh, I, I mean, every time. Can I just tell you that when when things happen at Westminster or other parliaments, so for example, when um, when groups engage in protests and walk out, or they or do something else. Uh, Everyone else might think, oh, that's is democracy in action. I wince every time I'm thinking, oh, this is going to happen, is it tomorrow? <laughs> Somebody's going to grab the mace or something like this. Um, so, yeah, so, so my perspective isn't quite the same as everybody else's. Uh, of course, there can always be a confrontation between parliament and government. And one of the things that I was very, very keen to do, it's, it's difficult to do, but was just to make sure that I was keen to draw the, make sure that people were aware more of the distinction between government and parliament. I thought that it, one of the things that had happened in Scotland was that the two had become slightly blurred. Now, it's always going to happen. You know, people talk about Westminster. Now, when you talk about Westminster, do you mean the government or do you mean Parliament? And when you talk about Holyrood, do you mean the government or do you mean Parliament? It's just these amorphous terms tend to encapsulate both. Um, but I've been very keen in this Parliament to make sure that the line is drawn. Now, you could do it in a confrontational way if you wished, but my, my style's never been confrontational anyway, the best of times. So it was never going to be my approach. I have been very fortunate in that I have no doubt that the First Minister herself and the government, but particularly the First Minister, respects Parliament. You know, I, I, she, is, she is a Scottish parliamentarian. She stood herself at, at, for election in 99. She believes in the Scottish Parliament. She respects Parliament and that has, absolutely made it so much easier for me to, to work with a government that respects Parliament. But there's been several times when it's been tested. So I mentioned earlier the continuity bill. I mean, that could have absolutely blown up because he was the government presenting a bill which I felt very, very strongly about. This is about the powers coming back from Europe. And um, these are mostly on devolved issues and they should in theory come straight to the Scottish Parliament but they were coming back to Westminster first before being devolved to the Scottish Parliament. And this was a source, it still is a source of great political friction. So the, 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 the UK government was publishing its continuity bill, the Scottish Parliament publishing its continuity bill on what was the, at that point a reserved issue. Uh, 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 well, not, not a devolved issue. Yeah. And um, yeah, I had to rule on the competency of the bill and I, I, I could just see being caught um, in the middle of this and uh, and I would just pay tribute to um, to the, the government as well for being able to discuss this as as mature individuals and you know um, respectful of our own institutional positions to be able to come up in the end we tried to reach agreement we couldn't reach agreement we ended up in in having a difference of opinion but we did so respectfully I published my opinion we didn't have a stand up row about it. Um, and the matter took its course, the bill went through, and then it was um, challenged and thrown out by the, by the Supreme Court. But um, it was handled, and, and it, it's not because, it wasn't because I handled it in a non-confrontational way, it was because the government also agreed that was the way to do it. So in these situations, it matters, it matters how the other side view matters. You know, I'm always going to defend, the presenting officer will always defend the powers, the institution, the independence of parliament, and um, so one of the one of the few areas, for example, I've had disagreement about, well, not a disagreement, but I've had issues with the government is about making sure that all announcements, for example, are made in Parliament, all announcements. So I've changed the rules in Parliament to make sure that there's never a reason why they shouldn't or can't get the opportunity to make the announcement. So having done that, having given them that flexibility, they should always make the announcement here and not be making it to press conferences or elsewhere. So it, there's been a little bit of friction on these issues, but very little because they also respect Parliament. And they recognise, all governments should recognise that it's not in their interest to have a supine Parliament. You know, if you to have any authority whatsoever, you want to be, A, you want to be challenged because your ideas should be robust and should hold up to challenge. And if they don't, you should amend them. That's the whole point. But also, if you present your programme to Parliament and it is approved by a Parliament that is independent and has some authority and has some force, and has some independence, it gives your bills, your acts, your budget more authority because it's been challenged by that process. You know, a, a patsy parliament does nobody any favours. I couldn't agree more with that. Um, and I think members have to think about that when they when they conduct themselves in, in committees and, and, and in the chamber as well. Can I ask you a question about centralisation now? I mean, so 
there was a big project in a sense to create the Scottish Parliament and to establish Scottish governments and, and, and the Parliament in, in Edinburgh. And some people from other parts of Scotland worried that, that an effect of that would actually be to, to centralise power in, in, in Edinburgh and, and give more, more power to, to the civil service. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is still a perception of, of centralization. Perhaps, you know, perhaps even that's been highlighted by, by, by experience, uh, you know, budgetary control that, 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 that the Scottish government is able to, to exercise. Um, and maybe also with the kind of tension between the Scottish government and the UK government, you know, so the issue about devolution to Scotland, but no further than Holyrood, rather than, rather than down, to, down, down to local government level or, or regional government level. Do you think that that is something that is a continuing concern um, amongst parliamentarians and more widely? And is, is there something that could be done about that? It definitely is. And it's it's been an ongoing concern for many years. The, 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 the problem when it was founded, it, I mentioned subsidiarity either, but subsidiar subsidiarity and devolution are to me are the same, same word, same process. It's about taking decisions as close to the individual as possible. Um, and the accusation has been levelled, whether it's true or not, the accusation has been repeatedly levelled at the Scottish Government and Parliament, and this is of all, um, of all political persuasion. So it was, it was levelled at the Labour, Lib Dem administration, and then it was levelled at the SNP administration, that they were centralising power. In fact, when the SNP came in, the government came in, they specifically uh, ended the ring fencing of a lot of local government spending and made a huge virtue of this and drew up a new um, agreement with local government about local decision making power, but have been uh, criticised, um, robustly criticised by local government in recent years for uh, underfunding and undermining local decision making. So, so it's an ongoing argument. Um, and the, the pandemic, I think, has thrown up um, the, the fact that across the UK, it's, it's an ongoing argument too. So when, when devilish was introduced for Scotland, um, Wales voted for it, but not so enthusiastically, and so they got much fewer powers. Lots of areas around England were offered, and hardly any of them took up the offer of devolved powers. Um, you know, most of them rejected it utterly. However, a few in more recent years did adopt, for example, local mayors or, or um, um, you know, mayors in most cases around the big um, urban conglomerations. And this pandemic has actually thrown, thrown up or shown the importance of local decision making, the importance of local knowledge, the importance of local systems of government. Um, so, and, and we had quite public rows between, you know, uh, Andy Burnham and others uh, representing these big urban communities in England and, and a centralised government that ne wasn't necessarily, or certainly has been criticised for not, not effectively delivering. So these are very, very current issues. And I think there will always be in tension. Um, the, the difficulty with... Um, the kind of devol devolution we have now is that it 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 is it is asymmetrical. You know, it, it is all sorts of parts of the country have different kinds of powers over different areas. It makes it very messy. Um, it can be you know for people who like you know nice clean lines of accountability and decision making, it can be a bit difficult to follow. And there's there's that whole argument that you know power always accumulates to the centre. So these these forces are constantly in in flux. And I think they'll continue to be. Um, my, own, my own personal view is I've, I've always been a, a supporter of devolving power at, at every level. Um, that's my own personal view. Um, I, others, have, others have a different perspective on it. I suspect that we will continue to see um, the pendulum swinging back and forward in this. So you know, when it swings too far one direction, you get a big reaction and you tend to get... What, what you often get, of course, is the... Um, local government reorganization at that point or something like that. So not saying that's the answer, by the way, before anybody jumps to that conclusion. So I don't know, I don't know what the answer is, Des. I think that it's, it's undoubtedly a, a still a live issue. So I'm, I'm slightly conscious of not, in, you know, um, uh, commenting too prominently on it when it's, it's, it may even become an issue at this forthcoming election. Yeah, I suspect we won't get local government reorganization because we haven't had that since, since 1995. Yeah. Um, but one of the issues that I think again has been been raised is, you know, to what extent the Parliament's actually been able to achieve change in some of the areas that 
that have been argued to be most important. So things like child poverty, things like health disadvantage, things like um, educational attainment or, or the imbalance in, 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 in attainment between people from different, different backgrounds. If the, the role of the parliament or the, or the Scottish government is to transform Scotland, I mean, judged against some of these, its own aspirations, it's not actually been able to achieve as much as it would have liked. And I, I'll put it no more strongly than that. Um, is that a function of the scale of the challenge in, in, in transforming these things? Or is it an issue about the way in which we tended to go about it by, by making policies, but not necessarily being able to implement the mechanics of, uh, of change? And does that get back to the centralization question? The parliament can decide what it likes, but unless it actually gets change going down at, at local level, then, then, then you won't actually get the kinds of social transformation that people are looking for. Mm. Um, well, I think you've absolutely identified what, one of what I would describe as um, um, well, certainly my biggest frustrations as an MSP over 22 years. You know, when, when I came in, if you, th if you think about the changes I thought we'd see to, to poverty, to equality, inequality in Scotland, how much I thought we'd transform and, and to be wrestling with these. I mean, I think everybody was horrified. You, you'll have seen the pictures not that long ago of people queuing in, in the snow for a food bank in Glasgow. And it's, it's really... It's really disappointing, isn't it, when we've had 22 years to challenge these these issues and, and to see the levels of inequality in Scotland still. And this is that's not a criticism of the current, current government. This is of all the administrations that have been. Um, I don't think in this case, I, I certainly wouldn't point to centralisation versus local uh, power decision making in this case. Um, I would identify another couple of issues, though. Um, uh, I think in, in terms of process, for example, one of the big successes, I mean, the Parliament has had many successes, many successes over the years. And I think that Scotland itself is, a, is just a much more confident country because of the Parliament and much more able to deal with its own affairs and not blame others for our weaknesses. And if you, if you take one of them, you know, when, when, uh, when, when we were first elected in 99, Scotland had the, the worst cancer record in Europe, constantly talked about our poor health, poor dental health, poor heart health. And, and the Parliament introduced the Smoking Act such a major decision, not just, not just in terms of the difference in need, but actually taking, the, this, taking a chance on something as controversial as this and you know, turning this country into you know, a leader in the UK on this issue. But huge, hugely successful, important, pivotal moment actually in the Scottish Parliament, but the success of that act and all the early legislation has meant the Scottish Parliament has viewed legislation as the as almost the most important vehicle so every time you have a, every time you want to introduce a policy or you want to make a change the immediate thought process is to introduce a bill in the Scottish Parliament that's how you go about it you legislate for change what we've not done is if you actually look at how how have we distributed wealth for example within the Scottish Parliament or how have we changed funding streams I actually think that our record uh, uh, overall over 20 years is desperately poor in this I think that uh, the budget process itself within the Scottish Parliament is one of the most, or until recently, because we've changed it to get, we've changed it in this session. And I, I actually thought this was the issue that would, that would dominate this session of Parliament. That was through you know, Brexit just trumped everything. But I thought we would concentrate on the new tax powers, the new social security powers, and the new budget process. And I thought it would be a real chance to focus on these issues, because the budget process till then was a real anti-climax, um, and. Um, it, 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 it wasn't even a huge occasion. I mean, it was a big occasion in the, in the parliamentary year, but not the, not, not the occasion it is at Westminster. And if you look overall, we've tweaked budgets here and there, but really in terms of changing the way that wealth is distributed around the country, or even the funding streams to different levels of government or organisations, I mean, there have been changes, but they've been driven by demand more than driven by political will. You know, and, and, and I think that's, that's a real, uh, reflecting on it now, I think that's, that was a, a mistake, you know, that we, we should have done more then and we, sh we should still now address budget process. The, 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 the control of money, the economic decisions you take are so important for the way a country develops. But we, we, we've still we've grabbed hold of legislation. So I think that process, I think, has, has and, and that was just the nature of it. Our, our legislation early on was so successful, land reform, adults with incapacity, additional support for learning. You know, there's so many big breakthrough moments there that it's not surprising that people have said, well, 
and, and so you get, you know, we, we want to wrestle with with uh, with our drink problem in Scotland. So we get the minimum pricing on alcohol. You know, it's that, that's what we do. We go for bills to legislate for, for issues. Um, but yes, uh, you know, it, it is, it, the, the, along with the electoral cycle, the fact that you elect a government for either four years or now for five years, it, it means that you don't have the big perspective. So although the parliament is, interesting you mentioned that minority administration where you got all parties coming together on a climate change bill, got people to look long-term and introduce long-term forecasts and long-term targets, it's actually difficult for governments still in their four year term or five year term to really grasp and make a big difference in, in some of these fundamental directions of travel. They're far more likely to be shaped by the events outside that, the banking crash, um, the nature of politics globally and so on. These, these things tend to thwart governments in, in their aims. And it takes an incredible amount of political will to overturn that. And that's, and that's difficult in a parliament full of minorities. Yeah, but so just so we don't end on a, a downbeat note, I'm going to ask you as a final question, Ken, what gives you greatest pride as someone who's been in the parliament for 20, 21 years? What, what, what do you think its biggest achievements are? Oh, I think it's the parliament itself, the difference is made to Scotland. I, mean, I, I do think, we, when we first came in, we were, I remember this, we were asked to make a little video. The parliament said, make a little video. They asked you very strange questions like, who's your hero? such like, and uh, which I always hate these questions. Um, but they also say, what difference do you want to make? And I, I remember specifically saying, I want Scotland to be more self-confident. And I, I think that's what we are. I think that people in Scotland now, they look to the Scottish Parliament and they want to hear in the Parliament the issues that are on their mind discussed. And I think that's what happens. I think that if you have something that's bothering you, um, that, that, that you think is unfair, unjustified, it's a difficulty you're facing, it's a grievance that you want to air, or it's just you know an issue about the direction of a society that you want to challenge. You will, and you can get it. You can, and you will get it discussed on the floor of the chamber or in a committee. And that's given people this ability, this belief that they can make a difference in their own lives, that politics matters, that it can shape their lives. It's made Scotland such a more liberal place than it used to be. I'm not saying we're not totally tolerant. We're still quite an intolerant country, I think, you know, but uh, if you think about it, the country I was brought up in as a kid was a, quite a prejudiced country, you know, we've always been slightly monocultural. There was an awful lot of bigotry and prejudice. I mean, when I was a young guy, it was difficult to be, to be gay or black or from any kind of minority community to be a woman in Scotland, you know, and I'm not saying it's, it's still not difficult for many groups, but we're far more, far more willing to to champion these issues, to recognise that inequality. The Pride March leaves from the Scottish Parliament. I mean, do you remember the battle over Section 2A? Yeah. yeah. Huge battle. The first battle we had, came into power and we had this massive battle about getting rid of such ridiculous, you know, pejorative discriminatory legislation. And now the Pride March actually leaves from the Scottish Parliament. And that, that is a transformed country in my view. So I think the country has been changed for the better. Um, but unfortunately, <laughs> it's a journey, you know, and you'll never reach the destination. And uh, but hopefully the Parliament will be there to take us on the journey. Ken, can I thank you so much for giving us such a, an articulate and, and thought through set of answers to, to, to these questions. I think this has been a fantastic session. So um, delighted to, to have you do that. Um, thanks also to, to Professor Sir Anton Muscatelli for his introduction at, at the start. And thanks also to everyone for, uh, for, for being involved with this. I didn't get to answer, ask as many questions as, as, as there were on the, uh, on, on, on the question and answer, but I, I did my best and, and hope, hopefully people enjoyed the, the session. But thanks, Ken, for, for, for what's been a really 